Hi everyone, it's Mark here again, and I'm delighted to be joined by Julio. And Julio, thank you so much for being one of our full members and for joining me today for this. Thank you, Mark, for having me. It's going to be good fun. So remind me where you're based. Ireland, in Dublin. You're in Dublin, that's right, I remember. And you're a music producer. Correct, correct. Music yeah, producer yeah. and musician and a technology enthusiast. Fantastic. Well, wherever this appears, there'll be links to you on LinkedIn and your work and our websites and 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 anything else you'd like us to include in the profile. So um, so but for the benefit of those who haven't had the pleasure of meeting you face to face, as I have, we're going to do have a bit of fun now to to sort of provide some anecdotes and surprises. So do you mind doing that? Is that OK? Sure. Let's go. Let's right. do it. So for the eminent music producer, Julio, I'm going to create your your perfect hypothetical fantasy cultural year okay um starting on the 1st of january and um and i'll do so from the answers to the questions that you give me okay 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 right. nice so my first question is do you have a favorite building uh yes um the first one that comes to mind is uh, uh it's a funny one is the chrysler building new york okay Beautiful. Art Deco at its very best. Yeah. So what I'd like you to do is imagine that you're sitting at a cafe um, in Central Park. OK, and you can see the top of the Chrysler building from where you're sitting and you're admiring its beauty. And it's sunny. It's June. Uh, it's 6 p.m. And you've been taking some time out in Central Park. And on your right, on your cafe table, is a book that you've been reading. What book might that be? Uh, the Language Instinct by Steven Pinker. Oh, OK. I don't know that. The Language Instinct by Steven Pincher. Pinker. Pinker. P-I-N-K-E-R. OK. What's the gist of the book? But don't no spoilers. Um, it's... Uh... It's a journey into the history of linguistics. Wow. OK, there we go. There's the first surprise. I love that. That's new to me. So I'm going to have to grab that. I'll send you a link. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, so that's you've just put that down for a moment and you've turned to your left and there's a drink there. Six o'clock over the yard arm. Um, what the, you can have anything you like. What's that drink going to be? So, well, it wouldn't be a cocktail. It would be a happy Hemingway. A happy Hemingway. A Hemingway. A it's Hemingway. A Hemingway. Yeah. Wow. Do you know the story about Hemingway? Did we talk about this last time? Um, Hemingway was asked to write a novel in six words that could make you cry. No, uh, we didn't talk about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was chatting about it. Yeah. Have you heard about it? Yeah. I've heard about it, but I'm not. I mean, I love Hemingway. I read yeah. some of his novels, uh, but I don't know all the different um, stories about him. So, and there are lots of stories about him, aren't there? But um, he was challenged to write a novel using only six words in total that could make you cry. And he came up with this. For sale, baby's shoes never worn. Okay. Incredible, incredible use of language economy. So if you're very into, clever, yeah, very yeah. clever. Anyway, that's an aside. Right. So you're sitting. Um, so you've got your Hemingway cocktail. You've just put the book down, the Pinker book, cafe, Central Park, sun, evening sun, glinting off the top of the Chrysler building at you. You're feeling quite pleased with yourself because you've been given the opportunity to spend a year studying the arts and culture music landscape in another country and you've been given the opportunity by a rather wealthy research foundation who are going to pay you a generous fee to cover your losses while you're away um, it's all expenses both at home and while you're away covered um, you get all the help you need all the transportation you need first class all the way um, all they want you to do is to come back at the end of the year and tell them what you learned about the arts and culture and music and performing arts landscape in that country. Okay? 
Okay. Yeah. Where are you going? Uh huh. Well, I'm currently in Central Park in New York. Uh, so I'll let's say that I got a, a funding from the Rockefeller Foundation, and I'm heading to learn. Uh, uh, well, it will be somewhere in Asia, um, and uh, probably I'll just uh, drop one uh, because of the desert of Gobi. Uh, I'll say Mongolia. Wow, that's a first. You're going right, so you're going to spend the whole year probably um in a one of those lovely mongolian um actually no we're going to put you in the in the in the capital city which escapes ulaanbaatar ulaanbaatar yeah yeah right yeah. so you're you're right okay that's great so that's that's the plan okay so i want you to imagine now you've left central park you've gone home you've packed for the year everything things are being shipped out for you at, at great expense anything you need probably your studio as well right <laughs> this is the nice. this is the fantasy year you see um yeah. and you're on the plane first class to Ulaanbaatar and um you were given an envelope just before you left by the the chairman of the research foundation strict instructions not to open it before you are airborne okay so you reach down and open the, the envelope and it makes it clear that while you're studying mongolian arts and culture they want to study you and they want to find out what the impact is on your psychology on your psychological well-being of being limited to one genre of music only for the whole year that's the plan okay as a okay okay you as a musician you'll find this difficult i'm sure um but what genre of music would you choose yeah well i'm i'm heading to mongolia so i'm studying mongolia uh, so it would be traditional Mongolian music, which is actually it's very uh, it's very particular, uh, very particular. There is a if you want to put a technical word, you will say overtone singing. That's yeah, the, of the... yeah, the harmonics in the voice. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I've I've heard that. It's incredible, isn't it? You know. Yes. Yeah. 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 You don't have to choose anything Mongolian, but you're happy with that one, are you? I'm happy with that one, yeah. Because yeah. you're going to listen, you're going to hear a lot of that for the year, aren't you? <laughs> for the year, exactly, exactly, yeah. yeah. Okay, so you arrive in Ulaanbaatar, um, and there's a delegation of local arts and culture enthusiasts and professionals welcoming you at the airport with your name on a card. Um, and Julio, we're over here. Well, there's he. <laughs> um, and they're going to in immerse you in the, in the culture of the country over the, over the next few days. Um, but they're doing so with a rather magical touch in that it doesn't have to be Mongolian art and culture that you you enjoy because they want to learn from you as well. So um, the first thing they're going to do is take you to a dance performance at a theatre in Ulaanbaatar. Um, and it can be anything. It doesn't need to be Mongolian art form, but it can be if you wish. But you've been told that you can summon up to the stage any dancer, living or not living, any dance group or any dance genre for this performance in this fi uh, fictional world that we've created, what would you like to see on the stage? Yeah, probably traditional Indian Carnatic uh, dance, um, which is related to the Car uh, Carnatic music in India. Uh, and it can, it's also possible too, because it's in, within the same geographical area of Mongolia. Yeah, wow. So a full-on evening's performance with an interval of, of Indian dance. Um, yeah, that's great. We've got some in fantastic Indian dancers in our network, actually. Uh, really, really good. I'll have to connect you. Um, great, okay. And after that show, they're going to take you out to dinner. And it's an international cuisine in Ulaanbaatar. You can choose any national cuisine you wish. Um, what would you choose? Um, Japanese. Right. Okay. Japanese. Uh, yeah. Beautiful Japanese food. Um, excellent. Now, the next day is Saturday. 
and it's sport day in Mongolia. And I know there's some amazing sports in Mongolia, but you don't have to restrict yourself to that. You can choose to either participate in or watch any sport you like. So what would your sport choice be? Yeah, I'm tempted to say that I would like to explore uh, traditional sports from China because I don't I don't know much about uh, you know obviously in uh, 2022 they hosted the Winter Olympics uh, in Beijing but um uh, you know I know that they they have uh, this uh, really um, niche subculture about ping pong which is considered a national sport in China yeah um, so. I might be a ping pong, you know. Ping pong, uh, okay. Yeah. Table tennis with Chinese with table, table tennis. Yeah. yeah Even uh, the, actually, actually, um, I'll choose something that is very uh, related to chi uh, to China and is also considered a sport. Even it's a game, and you probably heard about it. Uh, Go, you know the game Go. Yes, I have. It's it's a strategy board game, but it's considered a sport. Wow, like chess. Almost. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Great. So that there you are. There you've that you've 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 had your sport day. That's brilliant. Um, now the next day um, in Ulaanbaatar they have a, a rather special digital art gallery, and they can project the work of any visual artist onto the walls of this maze-like gallery um, using really high quality projection, and they've arranged them in chronological order so you can walk through the creative life of a famous artist or sculptor. Um, but you can only choose one artist. So who would it be? Yeah, I'll, I'll go somehow. Um, always uh, stick into Asia. <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, but I'll go for this Japanese artist. Uh, he's called Ryoji Ikeda, uh, or just Ikeda. So I K E D A. Yeah. Um, he's, he's a visual and sound artist. Uh, he currently lives in Europe, in France, but um, he does. Um, a wide range of works, uh, but they, they range from installations to projections to uh, um, anything which is pretty much technology related. So it can be projected or captured on a screen. Yeah. Uh, so Ryoji Keda would be an interesting one. He's a contemporary artist, but at the same time, he's not too conceptual. He's still um, pretty much, um, you know, like a visual, you know, like it's, it's, it doesn't go too much into the abstract world. And it has this very interesting relationship in between uh, technology and spirituality uh, in his work. That so, sounds it's... that sounds great. There's always a surprise here. I've not come across him, so that's something I'll be looking at over the weekend. Thank you. <laughs> that's great. Love it. Um, so they're going to lighten the mood slightly the following day, um, and you can choose any play or musical to watch. What would you be doing? Hamlet. Hamlet. Hamlet, Shakespeare, yeah. <laughs> nice. It's also quite unusual in Mongolia. <laughs> yeah, that would be, that would be, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, that's great. And then the next day is cinema day. Um, and they've got a wonderful cinema with a digital versions of every movie ever made. And you can choose to watch any movie you wish on the big screen which uh to for, for your colleagues to enjoy um stalker by tarkovsky stalker who was it by again tarkovsky um i, can, uh, I should uh <laughs> tarkovsky um uh, that's fun. i don't know if you it's the guy that did the uh, solaris is the same uh okay. andrei tarkovsky uh, the first one uh, is a Russian filmmaker from like the 1950s, 1960s, right. one of the seen... pioneers of sci-fi movies, actually. Brilliant. Oh, that's lovely. I'm going to have a look at that as well. Have you seen the Russian arc? Uh, no, I haven't. I know about it. Yeah. It's it's take it's like an hour long movie in one take. It's it's wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, set in the palace of St. Petersburg, I think. It's incredible. So. Okay, so yeah, that's uh, Sukhorov. Sukhorov. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, they must have rehearsed it endlessly before hitting the record button, um, and and that was done 
quite some time ago before they had huge amounts of digital storage capacity as well so yeah incredible okay so the next next day is sunday and you can have sunday lunch in ulan batur um and in your in this fantasy world that we're living in at the moment you can have lunch with any of your arts and culture or music heroes um living or not you can have lunch with them to work to, to ask them the questions you'd always like to have asked um anybody you at, at all living or not who are you going to have yeah lunch? oh living or not okay that's a that's a tough question because okay, I'll change that. Have... You can have you can have both. You can have lunch with one living hero, and then you can okay. have lunch with, or you can have the, no. Let's have all three of you together. Okay, all the three together. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, the, the, I mean, the, the first two people that come to mind, they're, they're from the science world. Uh, obviously, will be uh, well, obviously. I mean, probably uh, Albert Einstein. Yeah, and uh, Michio Kaku. Uh, the Japanese um, theoretical physicist. That's great. We'll have, we'll have a lot to talk about. I'm sure you would. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to be at the table, but I doubt if I'd have much to contribute. That's great. Um, I love I love Einstein's quote: um, "Creativity is intelligence having fun." It's great. Oh yes, yeah. yes, true, um, yeah, absolutely. Okay, now on the next day. Um, you're you've got one of those wonderful days that we rarely get where you wake up in the morning and you know that you can do whatever you like until you go back to bed again right um it's your day off in ulan batur um and you can you can have any transport or guides or help you need and you can do anything you like all day what would you choose to do um well it's part of the reason why i'm there okay but uh um just in case I haven't done it yet, um, my purpose to be in Mon my main purpose to be in Mongolia would be to do actually a project that um, I plan to do for several years, and the National Geographic kind of stole my idea, which is to go uh, to the desert of Gobi, uh, which is outside Ulaanbaatar, and in the desert of Gobi, uh, there are these caves with writings on the caves on the wall caves that are meant to be older than the Rosetta Stone. So those writings uh, um, based on uh, the, uh, you know, the, the local uh, the, the stories of Mongolia, then the, the, the National Geographic did a, a proper, you know, investigation document exactly all the different um, ideograms that are on the, on the walls. Basically they do represent uh, the origin of uh, the language from the Asia, from Asia, from the Hindu uh, to the kanji, from Chinese and Japanese. Uh, so it's it's kind of like the equivalent of uh, what Mesopotamia represented for us um, in the in the Eastern world. So um, as Mesopotamia represented, uh, kind of like one of the first four places in the world where civilization, as we know, it started with agriculture and so forth. So in the desert of Gobi. They were the first appearances of uh, a written, organized language, but it wasn't just a symbolic representation of objects and events, but it was an actual language to express abstract thoughts. Uh, but there has been a um, you know, massive debate in the archaeological community because um, the only way, this is like in the 80s and the 90s, to get access to those caves was to hire somebody from the local tribes and take you to the cave, but they were scared because there was uh, there is a legend that there are uh, giant worms, you know, in, in the caves, um, killing humans. So, uh, so I always thought, like, obviously, it's a legend uh, to organize, you know, a proper ex expedition, in uh, with archaeologists and uh, photographers, and go in the inside of the caves and document properly as much uh, writing as possible. So, what I would do is that in one form or another and uh, go to a desert of Gobi and try to uh, even just get a glimpse of the caves uh, or if I already did that, uh, get to know better the uh, local tribes, uh, the Us, uh, they speak uh, ancient uh, uh, Asian language, ancient Mongolian. So that's what I would have done during the day. That's great. That day what, a 
what a wonderful thing to do on your day off. That's fantastic. Okay, so now, so that's so you've done the year. You've listened to traditional Mongolian overtoning um, all year. You've done all of those things. You've 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 made your documentary, and it's time to come home. Okay, um, the the researchers are uh, relieving you of the burden of only listening to one genre of music. So you you're on the plane. And you can choose five tracks to listen any to anything that you like um, that you haven't been able to listen to for a year. What five tracks would you listen to? And so the first one will, put, will be any of the string quarters by Beethoven. Nice. Uh, second one. Quarters. Second one. Second one. It's a good choice. Yes. And then I'll listen to um, one of the back uh, transcriptions by Andre Segovia for classical guitar, any of the back transcriptions. Ooh. And then I will listen to the third movement of the Cone Concert by Keith Jarrett. Oh, what a what a correction! I love this. Yeah. <laughs> so we're on track number three. It's not easy, you know, to to limit to four tracks. I know. Five. And, um, you can have five. Two, okay. Okay. Two more. Two more. Two more. And then I'll probably listen to. Oh, it's, uh, yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll just call it the first ones that comes to mind. Mm. And the first part of Tubular Bells by Mike Oldfield. It's a Ooh. twenty minutes piece, but but still. I'm loving <laughs> this. Amazing. These are amazing great. piece of music. And, fi and, uh, and the fin final one. Yeah, the final one. Um, uh, one of the uh, ragas um, played by Ravi Shankar. Oh my lord! So, you've done a you've done a world tour on in music. This is just amazing. Uh, uh, yes, because I've, I was only listening to over the town singing for a year. Okay, so we've got the Beethoven, the Bach, the Keith Jarrett, the uh, Mike Oldfield, and we've got the Ravi Shankar. Those those are the first five things you're going to listen to on the plane. Okay, yeah. you could you could be Mark if you want. You could be very specific for Ravi Shankar uh, and uh, mention the morning raga, morning raga. Brilliant. And if I was being really cruel. And I had to ask you to choose just one of those five. Which one would you choose? Beethoven. Okay. <laughs> just Julia, because of emotional, <laughs> you know, yeah. just because of memories, obviously. They're all uh, beautiful pieces. And yeah. Unique, have you, their own kind. Have you, have you seen the movie My Immortal Beloved? Yes, of course. Yeah. 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 yeah fantastic. Okay. classic <laughs> uh, yeah. thank you so much that was really that was great that's a proper insight into what makes you tick i love it it's great um surprises and anecdotes all included which is great so <laughs> for those watching this um links to julio will be dotted around um we'll put a summary of the meeting in um and a bit of a bio um for, for julio as well um but julio for the don't rush off, but for the purposes of this recording, thank you so much for doing this. Um, thank you, Mark. It's 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 been great fun. I hope that I hope you enjoyed it. I did, I did. Yeah, it's fun. It's very, it's very fun. It's very interesting to see how all the different, um, uh, you know, uh, events, all the different, uh, um, how would I call it? Like even events. It's like a mental journey. Basically. It is. Yeah. <laughs> I, that I've just we've just been around the world in half an hour. Thank you so much, Julio. Thank you, Mark.